On today's episode of You Asked, how do you find a calibrator these days? What's the one thing folks aren't talking about when it comes to giant 100 inch plus size TVs? Will we ever get a TV that can produce all the colors? And is Sony really quitting OLED? Welcome back everyone, I'm Caleb Dennison and this is You Ask, the show where I answer questions that you asked in hopes that I can help you and others who have similar tech questions. If you've got a question for me, please send it to youasked at digitaltrends.com and let's see if your question gets picked to be answered on the show. First question isn't so much a question as it is a comment, but it comes as a reply to last week's episode that centered around projectors. It comes from Daniel Kelleher who said, the one thing no one talks about is where the center channel would go if you have a 5.1 or larger audio system. With a 100 inch TV, you would pretty much have to put your center channel on the floor or ceiling. Even a sound bar would be extremely low to the ground as the TV takes up pretty much the whole wall. So audio is very compromised. If it weren't for that, my next video component would be a TV. Daniel also shared these images of his setup and noted he uses an acoustically transparent screen so he can get his center channel behind the screen when it's dropped down, and it's also already below his TV when not using his projector. Well, first off, Daniel, awesome setup. I'm having trouble placing those speakers though. Are they Kef? It's the cabinet shape that's throwing me off. Anyway, what can I say but you're right. Although, now that we're talking about it, we can't say nobody is talking about it anymore, can we? But that's thanks to you. So, let's do talk about it. I think Daniel brings up a great point here, folks. One of the challenges with large screens, whether it's a TV screen or a projection screen, is that the bigger the screen gets, the lower or the higher the center channel speaker will have to be placed, unless you use an acoustically transparent screen where the sound of the speaker can go right through the screen just like it does in a commercial movie theater. And I've experienced this challenge myself, actually. I think it's an especially big challenge with ultra short throw projectors. The projector often goes where a center channel might go, and even if you mount the center channel directly below the screen, there's always the chance that if you don't have it all set up just right, the center channel could block some of the light from the projector, or if the speaker has a gloss finish, could end up reflecting some of the light coming from the screen. There are a number of challenges with large screen formats, but at least with some projector setups like Daniel's, an acoustically transparent screen allows a center channel to output sound closer to where the voices and actions appear on the screen. We call that anchoring the sound to the screen. So what's the solution in the case of a really big TV? You can't put anything behind it, so you'll indeed have to put a center channel above or below the TV. Not necessarily right at the ceiling or all the way at the floor, but close. Now fortunately, the brain is pretty good at making accommodations, at least in my experience. If you let your mind relax a bit, you can get to the point where the suspension of disbelief isn't just ruined by having the dialogue come from below or above where you see a person's mouth. It's extraordinary how your brain will make it work for you if you let it. If you can let go of your frustration that the speaker is just above or below the image, your brain will associate the sound with the image. But I also know folks who just can't do it. So what then? Well, I'm just imagining things here, but with an OLED QDEL or possibly even micro LED screen, you can turn the screen itself into a high quality speaker that's directional enough to be effective. You may have a center channel that isn't perfectly voice matched to the rest of your speakers, but at least the sound is literally coming from the screen in that case. Some of Sony's OLED TVs do this right now. But for any backlit TV, that isn't possible. The TV speaker system would need to become a big priority in the overall design. It would need to have a sound strip at the bottom and audio processing that essentially lifted the sound using psychoacoustics to make it seem like the sound was coming from that screen. I think that can be done, but it's gonna take time, money, and intention on the part of the manufacturers. Guess now is the time to start asking TV manufacturers to make the audio of the TV a big priority for home theater enthusiasts and frankly, that doesn't seem like a big ask to me since these are super premium TVs and already cost a small fortune. You might as well go for broke while you're going broke and get a decent audio system out of the TV too. Outside of that, it's gonna be a compromise, which in the end, isn't a ridiculous ask. Home theater systems are riddled with 
demands for compromise, aren't they? Next question comes from Nathan McGraw who writes, I recently built my dream, to me, home theater, and I'd like to know I'm getting the best visual and audio experience. How can I go about finding a calibrator in my area? Furthermore, in your opinion, do you believe having a home calibrator come out is money well spent, or can you get away with the built-in auto setups? Nathan, I am so glad you put this question in front of me this week because I've been needing to offer some help around this for a long time. I get asked all the time, how do I find a calibrator in my area or one who's coming through my area or willing to come to me? Now, first off, everyone, I want you to know that I understand and I want everyone else to understand this too, Google is not very helpful on this. You can be an ultra pro certified Googler and come up with bubkiss when trying to search for a calibrator. Next thing I wanna do is call attention to the fact that display calibration, whether for a TV or a projector, and audio calibration are two totally different things. And it's not uncommon to find a calibrator that does displays but not audio or vice versa. Obviously, it'd be great to find one person who is a legit expert at both. But even finding legit experts in the first place can be a little tricky. The next important thing to know is that, and I wanna be careful about how I say this, but audio calibration is less, let's say, resource intensive than video calibration. Audio calibration is easier and less expensive to DIY than video calibration, simply because the tools to do audio calibration are less expensive. The art of audio calibration is still a very specialized skill, and I'm not here to say audio calibration is easier than video calibration, but I will say that from a cost perspective, it's less expensive to get the tools you need to perform an audio calibration, and from there, it's all about how much willingness you have to educate yourself online and just get the job done. Video calibration, done well, requires very expensive tools. You can get by with patterns on a disc or download some files to a USB instead of buying a really expensive pattern generator, but ultimately you're gonna need the software. I use Calman by Portrait Displays exclusively, and you're gonna need at least a colorimeter, and even those run into the thousands of dollars at the low end. With all of that understood, you can understand why it will be easier and less expensive to have a pro come out and take care of it for you. But how do you find that pro? Well, I'm gonna drop two links in the description. One is for an ABS forum thread that has a running database on custom installers listed in order by the US state in which they operate. The second link will go to the ISF database of calibrators. That's Imaging Science Foundation, by the way. Now, you don't have to have an ISF certification to be a good calibrator, and you also aren't necessarily a good calibrator just because you have ISF certification, but it's a good starting point to at least find names and businesses from which you can do some research into reviews of their work, and that's the key here. Look up reviews of the folks you're considering using. You don't want a hack plumber working on your pipes, you don't want a hack calibrator doing a meh job on your system either. Another approach is to go to the Cedia website and look for contractors there. Cedia stands for Custom Electronic Design and Installation Association, and Cedia puts on an annual trade show that I sometimes attend. It's actually one of my favorite shows. They run ongoing education seminars, certification trainings. You can probably find some Cedia certified experts in your area through the Cedia website just to get you started. You could also try calling local home theater shops in your area, even if they aren't in your city. A home theater specialist shop in your state may have calibrators that they work with or can make recommendations on calibrators they know that can come out to you. Now, there are some automated systems you can use. Samsung offers one that works with an app for their TVs. It does a pretty good job, but that's just for Samsung. And on the audio tip, lots of AV receivers come with auto setup systems. I'm not a huge fan, but some people just absolutely swear by some of them. So you can give that a shot, but if you wanna know you're getting the absolute best, a pro will provide that for you. And let me just say that I'm hopeful that we can cultivate a new crop of calibrators soon. I see home entertainment enthusiasm on the rise and we're gonna need new blood in this profession and soon. It's a very niche career opportunity, but a good one and a fun one if you ask me. And by the way, Nathan, props to you for putting all that time and effort into building your system. I'm proud of you, man. James Dewberry writes, a common stat for TVs is percent of color gamut. So I asked the following, one, how long, if ever, will it be to see a TV that reaches 100%? 
Two, why is there a vast section of green tones that's always outside the triangular measurement area? Thanks for your question, Jamie, I love it. So first things first, what is color gamut? Color gamut is a term we've come up with to describe the range of colors that a device can display or record relative to the total range of colors that is within the visible spectrum. Usually we see this visually expressed on a chart like this, where the sort of triangular color blob represents the visible color spectrum, that's like all the color we can see, and the actual triangle within it represents the color gamut. That's what the TV or monitor can display or the camera could capture. Now there are a bunch of different color gamuts and they've been given some names. On the low end, we have the NTSC color gamut, which was developed in 1953 as a standard for broadcast television. Then we move up to sRGB, also known as Rec. 709, which is the standard that we have for SDR TV these days. Then Adobe RGB, then there's DCI P3, and then at the top, the one with the most colors in it is Rec. 2020. Who developed and defined these color gamuts is another video for another day. For now, I think it's important to note that in TV anyway, we tend to talk about Rec. 709 for SDR, and then either DCI P3 for cinema or HDR TV, and Rec. 2020 is and has been sort of this holy grail color gamut for the last several years. Right now, the Rec. 2020 color gamut is still the big, audacious, aspirational goal. We're getting closer, but the best consumer displays right now, like the Sony A95L, managed to get to the low 90% area for coverage, which is kind of a big deal because for a long time, we were stuck down in the mid 70s. There are some prototype displays that did get to 95%, but they were prototypes. I'd like to think that we are maybe, I'm gonna guess like five years or so from consumer displays pushing the Rec. 2020 envelope. That's just a guess though. I'd love to be surprised and see it sooner than later. Now, as for your question about green, why is there so much more green outside the triangle than the other colors? I'm gonna be totally transparent and tell you this kind of color science thing is just over my head. What I do know is that the human eye is more sensitive to certain wavelengths of light than others. So that might increase the visible spectrum around the green areas. I also know that TVs use red, green, and blue color primaries, and that each of those colors is represented by a very specific number on an X and Y axis. In order for the red, green, and blue to combine to make the most amount of colors possible, a specific value or number of green must be assigned. And I imagine that particular value, that particular green, leaves some of the other green spectrum behind. And that's as far as I'm gonna take that. But I appreciate the question because you've gotten me curious and I'm gonna take every opportunity that I can to learn more. And now the one I think you've all been waiting for, a question that I had a feeling was going to be a thing, despite my frustration that it never should have been in the first place. Uh, Chris, you gotta toss in some SMH memes in here, would ya? You cannot be serious! The question comes from Alejandro Rodriguez who asks, so is Sony really abandoning OLED? They had the best on the market. What? Guys, Sony is not abandoning OLED. Please calm down. Look, I'm not here to play a blame game, but here's why the question that never should have been a question has come up. A YouTuber I respect very much, why am I being coy here? I'm talking about Vincent Tio published a video titled, Sony plans to ditch OLED and use mini LED for 2024 flagship TV. Here's why. Now, I would argue the problem that has arisen should not be attributed to that headline. The problem is that some folks didn't watch the whole video or any of it and understand what Vincent was actually saying. Instead, they took to the forums and went all keyboard warrior and started spreading around misinformation by parroting that headline out of context. And well, it stirred up a bit of traffic. So some other folks started hopping on the bandwagon to try to get in on that traffic or rack up those views. I encourage you to go watch that video. We'll link to it in the description. But also, here's my take. Vincent and I were at the same press trip as guests of Sony in Tokyo. Part of what we learned there is that Sony is leaning hard into its mini LED backlight technology and is targeting a mini LED backlit LCD TV to be marketed as its flagship. Now, I don't have time for a debate on what the term flagship should mean, but 
What I will say is that what you consider flagship to mean and what the marketing gurus at corporations like to use the term flagship for are often going to be very different things. I mean, Samsung never called its QD OLED TVs their flagship. Still don't, I don't think. But I think a lot of TV enthusiasts would say, uh, nah, sorry, Samsung, your marketing team is wrong. The S95C is your flagship TV. Sony isn't quitting OLED. I just think they made the A95L OLED so good and the QD OLED technology is at a place where incremental generational improvements are fairly minor, that trying to cram another OLED TV into the pipeline in 2024, an A95M or N or whatever, just doesn't make sense. Also, keep in mind the A95L came out late in 2023, and some would argue it looked and performed like a TV we would expect to see in 2024 anyway. No guys, Sony has an opportunity here to reestablish some dominance in the mini LED TV space by coming out with a mini LED TV so good that it just trounces the competition. That is gonna expand its sales and that's just good for the company. The A95L is practically selling itself right now. It doesn't need help. It swept most awards and shootouts across the globe. Most of them. <laughs> the X90L, X93L, and X95L, they didn't get nearly as much attention in 2023 as that OLED TV did. And I suspect we're gonna be talking a lot about the new versions of those TVs in 2024. So again, Sony not ditching OLED, they are perhaps just not making it a massive priority for 2024. Even Sony isn't crazy enough to take the best TV of 2023, pull it off the market and say, you know what, we just did that to prove we could, and then drop the mic and walk out of the room. Thanks as always for watching everyone. What did you think of this week's episode? Please let me know down in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll see you on the next one. And until then, here's two other videos I think you might like. Holy praise Jesus.